All right, some things I've learned over the years. Tip number one, whenever you're in super muddy conditions during the day and the temperatures are at night are getting cold enough to freeze, what you're gonna wanna do is muck out your tracks. Get a shovel, get a stick, do whatever you can to get the mud out of your track area all the way around this thing because what's gonna happen is you're gonna wake up, you're gonna be ready to go to work, you're gonna warm up your engine, you're gonna go to move this thing and nothing's going to happen these tracks will freeze. So if it's never happened to you, just think about it. Now you know, not like GI Joe says, but now you know. All right, so tip number two, this is really about consistency, um, doing the same thing the same way every time. There's a couple things to note about the machine. First of all, this is a 2021 brand new HRE 4000. The 4000 is much more prone to this, what I'm about to talk about, than the 5000 is. The fi HRE 5000 is taller mast, a little more robust connecting points here. Uh, it's a bigger machine all around and it doesn't quite do what the 4000 does. So what I'm talking about is what I like to call the, the mass leaning back. Whenever I start to drive a pile and let's say it's on super hard ground, um, that mast as I'm applying down pressure is gonna wanna lean back a little bit. To counteract that, obviously if I didn't have down pressure, then it wouldn't lean back, right? Okay, so let's say that I don't do down pressure. Well then now that the piston in this is not engaged so there has to be enough down pressure to actually you know have that pile lift this this head up and press the the, the uh, cylinder up to actuate the hammering action so what i like to do is i like to call it it's a feathering action so you've got to kind of instead of just full bore you're down and you're hitting the hammer you've really got to kind of give it just enough down pressure enough to engage that hammer to where you can give it a couple blows and really you're kind of feathering between the two and by feathering between the two of these, you're not causing the mass to lean back all the way. If I were to just keep on hammering with it leaned back all the way, the thing is, is that if I were to take this stick as an example, and let's say that it started out straight, but at the very beginning, I started back, you know, a foot at the top, that's 15, 16 feet in the air. So if I started back here and I started hammering it, well now it's going in at that trajectory. It's not really gonna be straight by the time you get done with that thing. So the biggest thing to note is that you gotta feather it if you're starting to see that lean back action. And don't think that you can just, oh, I can just tip this thing forward and lean the mast back this way to counter it. Cause here's what's gonna happen. By the time you start trying to do countering and you know, like if it's bobbing and weaving and sometimes the mast I even lean a little bit to one side because of that action. What I can tell you is in that pile, that first 15% of the pile, typically most ground, it doesn't matter what you do to it after it gets in the ground that first two to three feet. I could lean my mast a foot over and, and that pile is still already, the trajectory has already started. If I'm in the ground that far and then I try to do something, well, it looks like the pile's moving, but really all that's happening is the pile's bending and it's, it's still going down at that trajectory. Even though I may have bent that mast or leaned it back, it's still going down at the trajectory that you started with. So the biggest thing I wanna say is, Everybody has their own way of doing things. You might be an operator of five years and you're saying, hey, I have, I've always adjusted it as I'm driving the pile down. When I notice that it's getting out of whack as I'm driving it, I always adjust it. That's great, whatever works for you. But what I can say is that what I've noticed in all the years that I've been running these machines is that just do the same thing the same way every time. Don't try to manipulate it on the way down. It, it will come out all right if you just do the same thing the same way every time as that pile is going into the ground, especially after you've already got in the ground two to three feet. It's gonna do what it's gonna do. So anyways, that's all I got to say about that. That's tip number two on consistency. All right, so tip number three. This was brought up to me when I bought my very first machine from the guy that trained me on a few things, tips and tricks. Um, this is to keep this hammer in about this area whenever you're trying to use the auto level. Now, granted the auto level on this brand new machine is on the left side and most of them they're on the front side, but disregard that fact. 
the big thing to note is this, this is a big heavy object and it's connected right here and right there. So as you get this hammer above that connecting point, that metal object being so heavy acts kind of like a pendulum. If you start to auto level and the auto level thinks, hey, I need to pull it back and I need to pull it left to get it level. Well, that the weight and the inertia of that pulling back and pulling left causes it to do what I like to call it like this circle of death. And if that thing is up too high when you're auto leveling, it's basically gonna be fighting, hey, I just pulled it back and left, but now the, the inertia wanted to kind of bounce back this way, and then it's gonna see that happen, and then it's gonna to try to pull it back again. So the fastest way to make the auto level work efficiently on a 4,000 is just to keep the hammer in the low position. The 5,000 is so beefy and robust, you don't really typically have too big of a problem with that, but either way, this tip is just to keep the hammer about here whenever you're using the auto level, not up there. So tip number three. All right, so tip number four, how to be a little bit more efficient and, and speedy whenever you're going from pile to pile. Uh, but I wanna go through a few things uh, that, that I've learned over the years that help, help me be more uh, efficient and, and speedy from pile to pile. So go ahead and let me see the camera really quick. So one of the things I wanna point out at first is that if you look, If you look at the string line versus your foot, you'll see that, I know that the shadows and stuff, let me see if I can't block the shadows there. You'll see that your string line is perfectly parallel to the edge of your foot. You are keeping your eye on that as you are rolling the machine. The next thing is, as I zoom in here, really close, I actually have a nail. Uh, this is what you'd see, you got whiskers and a nail. This is just so you can see it perfectly, but All right, as I zoom in, you'll see that my foot is literally halfway through the nail and it is centered on the foot. So that's my goal of what I'm trying to do whenever I'm setting up to drive. Some job sites, I'll let you take that back over. Some job sites operate a little bit differently. That might need to be the center of pile. Uh, I typically set up a job site to where that is the edge of pile so that everything is all the same. And that way it's easier to set up your foot. And that's one of the great things about this machine versus a PD-10 or something else is that the operator has the best vantage point to get set up exactly where he needs to be and how he needs to be set up. But what I want to do is I want to show you kind of as I'm moving, pretend that I just finished a pile and I'm moving to the next pile. These are the things that kind of speed you up and actually make you a little more efficient along the way that I'm doing at the same time. I'm actually dropping my foot to the ground because most of these systems you're going to have a pin that you need to, to sit perfectly on. So I'm going to be dropping that as I'm moving, but as I'm moving I'm hitting the auto level. So by the time I get to close to where I need to be and I get it going out, I can go ahead and hit stop auto level and I'll come in and I'll dial it up and then I'll drop it and I'll look, see if I'm on my pin. And then I'll just drive it back, drive it forward, twist it, because sometimes your piles, your uh, string is not parallel. But you get it where you want. You check for consistency on the, the bubble to make sure it's perfect. If you're using the 5000, you just hit auto level again. Check, make sure it didn't move off your pin. And then you're, you're ready to lift your mast and go. The big thing about, the big thing about that is consistency, um, you know, I'm doing two things at once. When, when I first get off that pile, I've lifted the head up high enough and I'm dropping my foot to get close to the ground because when we set up on a, a penny nail, because that's what these, these surveyors use, they use six inch nails with a penny head about that big that you can actually see, I am literally using that penny head and depending on if we're on a center type deal to where it's the edge or the reveal of the inside of a U-shaped uh, hat channel type pile, our accuracy matters to be as close as physically possible. And I'm talking about the 16th of an inch. So if I get up on that penny nail and I hit level, well, that leveling, it causes it to move. It causes the mass to, to move, right? Well, if, if you're moving the mass and leveling it, now you're not on the penny nail again. So that's why you have to kind of do it back and forth. Get close to it. And that's why I walk, as I'm walking to the next pile, I'm hitting auto level so that the machine's kind of adjusting as you're getting there. I don't ever let auto level do it because it's not fast enough. You, you gotta be able to adjust it 
when you get there faster, but it's kind of keeping you where you need to be close to by the time you get to the next pin. So for me, those are my tips and tricks uh, for consistency. It's just getting to where you can run the machine blindfolded. You're picking the head up, you're hitting auto level as you're walking, you're dropping the foot, raising the mass a little bit if you have time, and then you're getting uh, to, the, to the nail and you're pretty much leaning forward and seeing the nail on the head and you're, you're adjusting it and then you're auto leveling again or with the 5,000 or if it's the 4,000, you're manually doing it. So just to recap, when I get done with that pile, what I'm thinking about as I'm rolling forward is A, boom back in, B, keep my foot parallel to the string line as I'm rolling, and then C, as I'm rolling, go ahead and hit auto level because the undulations in the ground and the terrain as you're moving, you want it to be as close to level as possible so that whenever I guesstimate where to stop and then start booming out, uh, that guesstimate is going to be pretty darn close because what's happening is if, if I didn't change the terrain right now, I'm actually on a slope. If I get down here and I leveled back out, well, when, when I get to that point and if I'm not level, my foot needs to be leveled and I think that I'm where I need to be and I go ahead and level it, that could mean that my foot needs to swing back this way another two inches. Well, now I'm doing all kinds of playing back and forth. So auto level really gets you closer to where you need to be. It's where you get to the point to where you're guessing where you need to be, then you can dive into what I call no, no brain mode where you're just moving your hands. You know what these controls do and you can basically look here, you bump it out, you roll it forward, you roll it backwards, uh, you lift the foot up, you raise the hammer up. Um, but one of the key things in this is you're not just trusting the auto level and you may not have seen it, but uh, it's level right now. What I'm gonna do is, is, is tell you another thing is that say that we're on a terrain and you leveled it with the auto level, but then you had to adjust it uh, once you got up here. Well, that might have, have knocked it out of level. So you look, you check your level, you adjust it, you look again, because if you adjust it, let's say that I was out of level and I go to adjust it. Well, now my foot may have moved this way. Um, some people operate things differently. So, you know, say you have done things differently your entire life and what you're doing uh, as a professional pile driver. Great, I'm glad that you, you have your way of doing something, but this is, this is basically how we have found to be efficient over time. But you're gonna check that level, operate, move, check the level again. Don't lift your hammer until you're perfectly plumb and directly on your nail. And then you can ram that pile in. The, the biggest thing is consistency, consistency, consistency. So uh, those are the things that are going through my mind whenever I'm running from pile to pile to pile to pile. Um, there's probably some other stuff, uh, but I can't think of it right now. So. Hopefully that tip helps you out a little bit in your endeavors. All right, so tip number five is what we like to call keep your head on the swivel. It's a motto that we, we try to preach and, and really it's for a lot of reasons. It's not only for safety, you know, you're keeping an eye out for people entering your zone so that you know they're there. Um, but really what's happening is you're looking for a lot of things. If you're on a utility scale solar site, uh, A, if you're running the machine, let's say that you're walking this machine back to the uh, starting origination point. Well, as you're walking, you should be looking down the barrel of all of the rows that have already been completed because sometimes you'll catch, oh, it looks like one pile is, is kicked out of line or one pile is still up too high because it never got tapped down correctly. Um, there's a couple things that you're looking for, but if you're all the time looking for inconsistency, you're gonna spot it, kind of like a sore thumb, it'll stick out. Um, so that's one, one thing that you're looking for. The other is just whenever you're running your own line. So most job sites are, everybody's different in how they do things, but some use lasers, some don't. And, and let's say that you're using string line uh, and somehow someone ran through your site, bumped your string line and actually it lifted up above the piles that you've already done. So now your string line is four inches too high or at least most of the time, or let's just say it's, it's, uh, it's knocked out of whack. Uh, whatever the case may be, try to keep your eye out on your own row. Look back at your progress. Does it look like it's straight? Does it look like it's, it's doing well? Uh, but as you're running, you're just keeping your head on a swivel, looking for issues, looking for problems, looking at the machine, trying to make sure that bolts aren't flying off or loosening up or backing out. Um, you are, keeping your head on a swivel and trying to be extremely uh, aware of your surroundings and, and the job site and the how well it's all going together. Uh, you know, that, that's a big thing that we try to train 
because it's it's hard for one person to go through an entire site and make sure that it's perfect but if all of your people that are working on that job site and let's say we've got 20 guys on a job site are all at all times looking for issues well they're going to spot some issues and they're going to mark them and flag them and, and they'll be able to be dealt with so head on a swivel all right so tip number six if you are operating this machine this might be a rental machine to you uh, but as time progresses you're going to be what we call a professional pile driver you're going to be a professional at what you do so one tip i would give to you is just don't drive the pile too far because it is a world of hurt to try to get a pile back out of the ground. Not to mention the fact that the engineering values and what goes into actually designing the pile length, the thickness, everything about it, get blown out of the water when you've got to yank a, a pile up four inches. Um, it's really difficult to get that pile up sometimes depending on the type of soil that you're going into. If it's sandy, silty clay, then it might come right up. If it's only six feet in the ground, it might come right up, but man, We've put some piles in the ground that had 23 minute drive times and literally were 12 feet embedment. That pile is more than likely, I don't care what you get on it, is not coming up. You're probably gonna have to get a backhoe and dig down six feet besides it to try to break it free. So as a professional pile driver, my tip to you is remember that you're only doing one thing professionally and that's driving piles. So make sure you don't drive it too far because it sucks to try to get it back out and you really shouldn't have to ever because you're a professional. All right, so tip number seven is if you are familiar with running a C-channel pile, there's a lot of brands out there. Omco, Game Changer has C-channel. Uh, you've got uh, Unirac is a big one. Um, Sinclair Designs used to be Patriot Solar. There's so many different C-channel piles out there and as you drive piles, you'll notice they all seem to do the same thing. As you're driving that C-channel pile, let's say it's this way and you're driving this pile, it seems that most soil, if it's if it's got some sort of thickness to it or it's, it's hard, it's not just a farm field in Illinois, which is usually perfect by the way, uh, soil, the, the, the open side is where it's gonna lurch. So no matter what, when I drive my pile, perfectly straight, the same way, the same way every single time. When I lift that head off of the pile, somehow it always wants to lurch this way. Most racking, honestly, it doesn't even matter. If they all lurch this way, your entire row lurches this way a few inches, it's going to build the same way. Uh, it's not going to have any issues going together. It's not going to affect how straight it looks. It's not going to have an issue. But some people, I've seen other people talk about how they try to adjust for it. The thing that's hard about it is, is it's a guess. You don't know exactly how hard it's going to lurch. Sometimes it lurches harder than others, especially if you're in Missouri and there's lots of rocks on the way down. Man, I tell you what, rocks will literally, I've seen a Unirac pile start out like this and as it was driving, literally move 90 degrees. I mean, the thing, when I pulled the head off of the pile, Say the pile started right here, it literally immediately lurched to the side and to the left about 18 inches. I mean, you can't even build on that. So C-channel is so hard because you have memory in the steel. It's a cold rolled steel to get that C-channel. You can't really push on it. You can't really bend it. Uh, depends on the, the brand, but most of them don't want to play nicely. And if you try to overcompensate by bending it this way or bending it back, you're just mess messing up the engineering values of that pile. But the, the tip that I want to say on this is know that C-channel piles will probably lurch. Um, I-beams typically hardly ever lurch one way or the other. Uh, and if they do, it's always to the open side anyways, which is great because the open side is typically running north and south on a tracker per se or east and west. They're all in line. So it's usually not going to affect it too terribly. And the cool thing about I-beam piles is that they can be bent a little bit and they don't have memory in the steel. So, you know, if it lurches four inches this way because you're on a rock, technically you can take a skid steer and bump it and bend it back a little bit. I'm not going to say that I'm an engineer and that that's not affecting the values of, of how that system goes down, but I can tell you anybody out in the field, they're doing it. They just, they just not, might, might not be talking about it. So either way, that's a tip for the C-channel. Just know what to expect before you get into it. Controls, getting to know your controls. The pictures do say a thousand words, but just so you know your controls, this 
races and I've got the motor down so this might bog but I want you to be able to hear me so this raises and lowers the the mast this engages the hammer but the hammer this engages the hammer to start hammering but the hammer will not hammer until there is enough down pressure on whatever you're pushing against and you'll understand why but when that head see how it has movement up and down it has to have force from below and pushed up all the way which won't happen unless you drop the head on something and then once it's up high enough the hammer can be engaged so next on the list is the tracks it's pretty self-explanatory you know you imagine it like a skid steer push this track forward it goes that way same to go straight you got to do both of them at the same time so this is your mast up and down Let's see if I can see yeah so you'll notice my foot down there up and then down okay so this is where the magic's at I kind of call that on a keyboard you have your home keys so whenever you're operating this machine and you're doing it blindfolded because that's how we do it you gotta know your machine one of the things that I do is I, I have my hand right here these are like my home keys so all I got to do is bounce over this position is my adjustment position if I need to make my mast so you can see my hands yeah you can kind of see that so my bubble is not perfectly centered right now so I'm gonna be bouncing it back right now I don't have the control because my motors down and my hydraulics are not going full force but in this position I'm bump 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 this is my position to, to adjust my bubble and I'm not looking at that when I'm, I'm doing this I'm only looking at the bubble and I'm adjusting accordingly but knowing where my home key is home key jump over and then as I'm, I'm running the machine I can raise and lower my mast but these two joysticks are the only two joysticks that are next to each other <clears throat> so you can always tell where your home key is at and allow you to bump over and do what you need to do um, the last blast is booming you in which is probably gonna throttle me down and kill the machine nope so that I'm booming in right now <coughs> so auto level I already leveled it but yeah so it's not gonna think that it's leveled so if I hit auto level right now it's going back and forth uh, getting to know your machine you have lights uh, for the machine the beacon light on the back and this is where if you're sitting on a pile for a long time you can just hit start and it'll keep that pile running uh, basically it's engaged both of these together that's great and we use it a lot.